One, two, three. Eddie James, you got a podcast with me. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and sing the next line. I don't I forgot the words. <laughs> Let's go ahead and dive right in and just say hello and welcome to the Choose Strong podcast. I am your host, Sally McRae, and I am joined by my co-host, Eddie McRae. So awesome so, to be back on the podcast with you, Eddie, yeah. to be back in the same uh, city as you. And state. And state. state. <laughs> that as well. Uh, we want to just take a, a quick moment here and acknowledge you, our listener, I and, and Eddie as well, we have had the very wonderful opportunity to meet literally hundreds of people in the past three and a half weeks through our travels who listen to the podcast. So being able to see you face to face, hearing your feedback, um, hearing what you think about the podcast and how it's impacted you. And many of you have shared your stories with us. We want to say thank you because we understand that the Choose Strong um, community is very strong. It's very uh, deep and wide, and we love meeting people face to face. So, if you're going to be at um, an event coming up where um, you know that we're going to be there, please don't ever hesitate or even think twice about coming up and saying hi and, and introducing yourself. Eddie and I love meeting people. We love people. And so um, we hope to meet you one day if we haven't yet. Now, I'm envisioning that you are out for a run, that you're at the gym, maybe you're making a meal, uh, driving in your car, whatever you're doing, thank you for choosing the Choose Strong podcast. And if you are looking to support our work, uh, we would so appreciate appreciate it. If you would download the Sally McRae strength app, um, I have filled that app with running and strength exercise. There's running programs in there. And yes, we have some really cool programs that we'll be rolling out in September of 2023. So please download that app. Um, no contracts, no obligations. You can either sign up for a monthly membership or a yearly membership. The yearly membership is probably the best deal because it comes out to like $8.30 a month. It supports all of the work that Eddie and I do. So our YouTube channel, all of the films and the media and the episodes um, that have to be funded, that is where a lot of the funds go to for that kind of content. Also, we are in, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, uh, writing book number two of my memoir series. And then of course, rolling out this podcast and yeah, just a lot of the things that Eddie and I do to create content. Downloading that app is the best way to support us. The second thing that you can do is grab my book, Choose Strong. If you have already read it and would be able to leave a review on Amazon or Goodreads, we'd so appreciate it. And I want to thank you in advance for getting that book. And it is on Audible now. Yep. So um, without further ado, let's go ahead and just move right in to today's podcast. We are breaking down the Bigfoot 200. And Eddie, very sad to say, was not at this race yeah. and everyone wants to know why, how could you abandon me? I know <laughs> so bad. Well, I, th before we talk about that, should we kind of go back a little bit and oh, okay. you yeah. know, talk about, well, since the last podcast that we did together, you have been very busy, <laughs> a little busy, right? And it's only been three weeks. Yeah. It's only been a few weeks. So mm -hmm. you after that last podcast that we did, you have since ran another race, obviously. You went... Uh, Traveled to a few... Should we just break it all down? Yeah, break it down for okay. us. Let's just break it because down. Because my head's break already it spinning. down again. Okay, no okay. singing, just focus. <laughs> I'm in a singing focus. mood today. There's going to be lots of songs coming out. You know any of the songs that I'm singing, go ahead and share that on social media. Maybe the next line. I do love that song, though. Okay, so we came home from Tahoe... We had about two days rest, and my favorite way to recover is as a family. And our kids are old enough now that when we get away, I actually am able to rest. You know, when the kids are little, it's like, it is not vacation for you. It's just going to another spot and being stressed out. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we had had a vacation plan for a while to go to Sedona because I fell in love with that area when we ran it at Cocodona. Yeah, let me, let me jump in here really quick because yes. I just thought of this, how... <laughs> 
we, speaking of me, Mackenzie and Isaiah, love when we plan vacations after you have raced because <laughs> we can actually rest. We don't have to get, hey, we're going to go for a run now. We're going to go for a hike up this like trail. We're going to, you uh, you don't have the energy to do that. Right, so it's kind of right. nice because we and, get to and actually. And I eat, like, I eat the eat amount lot. of food that's probably like enough for like two or three people. So I'm constantly eating, which is like in everything. Yeah. Like I don't hold back. It's like, yes, cheeseburgers and ice cream. And I mean, the 200s are really like sucking the weight out of me. And so I'm like, let's get it back on. Let's go for another scoop of ice cream, guys. <laughs> yeah. So we went to Sedona. So we, we went to Sedona. That was incredible. Mm -hmm. I think our last night, we a very special treat, treated the kids to a night at the Biltmore in Phoenix before getting on the plane the following day. That was an incredible experience. I yeah. think it was the nicest hotel we've said, the nicest hotel we've ever stayed at. 100%. Um, I don't know how people are able to stay there for an entire week, but what I loved so much too, the kids were so grateful. They were so excited, but had a huge twisty water slide, which yes, I absolutely went on. I love water slides. I loved that week though. I really felt like just, you know, our family of four, we're so close, but just having that time laying by the pool and having breakfast together every morning, you know, the kids love it when we stay at a hotel that has free breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> and you and I usually would get up first. You're an early riser. Eddie and I would get up like early in the morning. We'd have coffee, we'd have breakfast. And then the kids would like eventually join us. I felt like sometimes we sat at breakfast, you and I for like two and a half Long hours. Time, yeah. yeah. That was like my favorite time getting up in the early morning and just sharing a cup of coffee with you. And that view that we had out the window of all, of, you know, Know, those red Sedona rocks, mm -hmm. like it was just little things like that that allow me just to completely relax and and rejuvenate. I will say um, a little hard part of our vacation was that I was very sick, yeah, and I eventually had to go to urgent care mm -hmm. at some point to get medicine. So, um, I had bronchitis and sinusitis. And, um, if you listen to the previous podcast when I broke down the Tahoe 200, one of the things I talked about was, and I don't recommend this, but I, I haven't been sick in many, many years. And, um, I was very, uh, I don't know, I guess you'd say in denial as I went into Tahoe, I'd gotten sick like two days before, uh, my son had come home from summer camp and given me probably at that point was maybe just a sinus infection. But what I do know is a trainer and a coach is when you are sick and then you try to push at maximum effort, you're going to further get sick. You're going to make it worse. Your immune system is weakened. Um, and I knew that. So I knew that about 10 miles into the race that this is going to be a rough journey. And I was a bit stubborn because I had, I was very fit. I knew the course very well. I trained hard. I would have loved to win Tahoe 200. Like that was the goal. I knew that I was gambling, but I also knew that in order to make it to the finish line, I could only push it certain parts of that race. And so it was the end at night when I was really able to push and get on that podium. But I ended with um, a really broken down immune system and also in full awareness that in 17 days, I would be racing Bigfoot 200. So when we are in Sedona, I just woke up one morning and I just, I, I booked on an app, um, the local urgent care. I was the first patient in, had this amazing doctor and, um, was on meds within, you know, a couple hours and those meds the last day of those meds was like the morning of Bigfoot 200, mm -hmm. which we'll get to that later, um, turned out to, to be a, another rough situation yeah. for me because of that. So, so we went to Sedona, we came home, I think I was home for like a day and a half. And then, um, I had the wonderful opportunity to fly up to Eugene, Oregon and join my good friend Cameron Haynes for his lift run shoot um, show. So we we had a lot of fun running in the mountains. We we did a great podcast, um, which I think will probably be coming out maybe in September. Yeah, that was incredible. But I was still sick even when I did that. And I remember being so bummed because um, Cam and I had talked about doing the show like at the beginning of the year um, when where I was much fitter and stronger and um, had a little more muscle mass and probably could have really pounded more. Less, uh, less blisters. Too. Less blisters, all the things. So yeah. we still had a great time lifting and running. I just didn't feel like I was 100% when we yeah. did that. So came home from that and the next day 
we um, traveled up to LA and we did a book release and run event in what was Pasadena? The, yeah, in Pasadena. What was the name of the run shop? Run with run, us. Run with us. Yeah. If you have a chance to visit that store, what an incredible community. If you're looking for a run community in Pasadena, go to the Run With Us running shop. They have Monday night runs. They put on an incredible event for us. I mean, there was food and drinks. They had a huge sound system. The turnout was shocking to me. I remember I stepped, I had been signing books and talking with people inside the store. And then in the back of the store, they had this massive parking lot. I didn't realize. I walked out and I was blown away by the turnout that night. I mean, it really blessed me. And I got like bouquets of yellow flowers and it just, uh, my friend Tavi brought me a big box of donuts because people know how much I love donuts. It was, um, that was really sweet. And then I came home from that and two days later, Mackenzie and I went to the Taylor Swift concert. I had a couple podcast shows in between there. And then I flew up to Washington for Bigfoot 200. Yep. So um, for our listeners, yes, that's a lot. That's a lot while you're trying to recover. That was a lot while being sick. That's and- a lot when you got nothing going on and you're not recovering. <laughs> that's like full plate for, I think, everybody except right? for you. Yeah, I don't, I didn't have like a ton of training in between there. Like I went to the gym and I lifted, I did like some hikes, that run with Cam. Um, That was about it. The main focus was getting the body healed and trying to heal my feet. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is when I ran Cocodona, and this is a problem, situation, this is a situation. When I ran Cocodona, I had feet that had never had trouble with blisters, black toenails. They were very tough, very tough skin, calluses. Most of my career, I have run 100 mile races with one pair of shoe and I run through jungles, up volcanoes, through storms in the snow, through rivers. I mean, my feet were very strong. Cocodona completely ripped my feet to shreds. I mean, it wasn't uh, people's hair out of the blisters. I'm like, eh, it was, it was wounds. Yeah. Like my, all my skin that had been built up over those years was gone. So the issue that I am dealing with in the journey to completing the grand slam of two hundreds or the triple crown of two hundreds as well, I guess is kind of our side by side is I now I'm dealing with baby skin. I'm dealing with this very soft, sensitive skin on my feet. So even though the blisters go away, I don't have tough feet anymore. And I know that it's only a matter of time in the race when I'm going to be having problems. And I do everything. I do um, lubing up the feet. I, I do preventative taping. I've changed my shoes a little bit more. I'm doing all the things. I'm visiting the med tent. But um, each race... I am getting blisters and some old wounds are, are kind of popping back up. I think Tahoe was, was one of the um, hardest around mile 120. I noticed that a big blister was forming on top of that ulcer that had mm. just healed and there's a scar there. So it's like this blister on top of this scar. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a little rough. But, you know, so my training between was really focused on getting my immune system as strong as I could, getting as much sleep as I possibly could. But also, and I, I, I talk with people about this all the time because people are like, wow, you know, you do so much and um, shouldn't you be resting and shouldn't you be relaxing? And, but I, I've always wanted to be very candid and raw and vulnerable about uh, the real life that you and I live. As parents being involved in our kids' lives, we have social life. I do think that I could be probably a a more successful athlete if I was just self-focused all the time. If everything that I did was about recovering, training, racing, recovering, training, racing. But, you know, I think early on in my life when I was pursuing a soccer career, wanting to be this, you know, superstar of a soccer player and really creating that life of just being an athlete, I lost a lot. And I, I think I learned at a young age what's the most important and a life that is fulfilling is definitely one that is connected with community and it's filled with serving others and helping others and 
living a life that's real and all the ups and downs. And I think that on, on the flip side, yeah, I get to do a lot of this fun and exciting stuff, but I always, I also think about people that are in the race that line up that work two full-time jobs, you know, single parents that, you know, they finish the race and they go home and they're working a 12 hour shift at the hospital. Yeah. You know, they're going home to four kids and as a single parent and they're putting that work in. So we're all putting an effort somewhere. And I think that, yeah, it's very common for professional athletes to just focus on the training and the racing. And I have um, not bit shy about sharing that, you know, I have great sponsors and I, I could do that. My sponsorships would allow me to take care of the family and just train and race and that's it. But you and I, Eddie, choose to do an app, to have a book, to have a podcast, to travel and to engage with the community around us and to really build something because that is what we're passionate about. And, you know, being able to race is just another way to connect with people. Mm. So I think that, you know, I, yes, I am tired sometimes. Like I'll get home from, you know, sometimes just, um, public events, you know, I'll get home and, it'll be like the most amazing night, but I'm, I'm tired. And I, I know like, okay, I need to sleep in tomorrow morning and uh, move my training to a different part of the day. But at no time do I ever regret the things that I do. And we, we say no to a lot of stuff too. I mean, I feel like if I did everything that was requested of me, if I traveled to every event and I did every podcast and I did every race, um, I would one, never be home. And yeah, I'd really be running myself into the ground. But yeah. I feel like you, Eddie, since we were married, have also done a great job. And this isn't something that we probably, we could probably talk about more. You are, you yourself are so balanced in life and you always look out for me and do kind of, are you're the voice of reason at times we're like, you need to rest or I'll come home and you're like, I got it. Like I'm making dinner. I'm taking Isaiah to practice, go take a nap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want our listeners to understand that, like, the teamwork effort is real in our everyday life, not just when he's crewing me. Eddie's very aware of my load, and I genuinely could not be able to handle what I do without you. So I agree. I just I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Except for finally, it's finally waiting for that shout out. <laughs> so tying uh, what you just did into what you were just saying, getting into the community. You know, that's like why you do what you do. Um, you just got back from Leadville after finishing <laughs> Bigfoot, which we'll talk about. But Right. 36 hours that. after finishing Bigfoot, I was on a plane to Leadville. Yeah. What, what, how, yeah. Was, how was that? Leadville is one of my favorite events of the year. I experienced it for the first time last year. Um, it was a race part of the Choose Strong project. So I was not racing it. The goal was to complete it because I had done Badwater 135 and Andrews Crest just a couple weeks before. So it was kind of the same situation. When I arrived at Leadville last year, it was like, oh my gosh, like I'm tired. Leadville is the biggest 100 mile race as far as entrants go in the United States. So they don't have any prerequisites. There's no, like you can, like you, Eddie, could just say, I'm going to put in for the lottery. I'm going to see if I can run it. And so you do have a lot of new ultra runners to the 100 mile distance that are in Leadville. So that's always really fun because you have people that are so excited, you know, they're brand new to the ultra community or brand new to that distance. And it's like, everything is like a wonder and excitement. Um, but there's thousands of people in town for this race. And if you've ever been to Leadville, it sits at 10,200 feet. You are basically, it's a town in the sky. So that's why the race is called Race Across the Sky. And it's this cute little quaint town that usually can't handle that, you know, many people. But I'll tell you what, it is one of my favorite weekends of the year because you could go up to anybody, any stranger and, and make a friend. And it's like that in the aid stations, at the race expo, at the, the pre-race meeting is held on a football field and it's just thousands of people, you know, have piled into this stadium and, and everyone just hangs out. And so... I was given the opportunity by Bear Performance Nutrition, BPN, which is um, my sponsor, an incredible sponsor, and Adam Klink, who is a friend, but also the director of like the athletic club and the community and athletes. He was racing it for the second time. And for him, he was just like, there's, this is probably like a shot in the dark, but like, I would love to have you crew maybe pace. Um, he's very aware of my races and he's an elite level CrossFitter. And so he really understands like training and competition and 
without hesitation, I was like, yes, sign me up. And then I think I told you about that. Yeah, that I was that's gonna, usually how it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you were like, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. So yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. And like I had said at the beginning of the podcast, I was able to meet literally hundreds of people who listen to this show, who've gotten the book, or they're in the app using the strength and running workouts. I, I felt like even though I was so tired from the race, that my, my cup just overflowed. Because, you know, people, when I get to meet them, they share some super cool stories with me Mm -hmm. and um, really share their hearts. And I get to meet kids. I got to hold a couple babies. Um, So we did an athletic club in Golden, right outside of Denver. And we had several hundred hundred people come to that on the Thursday night before the race. And then um, Friday, we did the expo pre-race meeting. So I got to do a meet and greet at both of those things. And then Saturday was go time at the race. And experiencing it from the side of being a crew and a pacer, it was so much fun. And I know you remember it. Like you remember Leadville last year, Mm -hmm. what that was like. Yeah, I loved Leadville. It was a fun, especially the first like half of the race when everyone is like together and yeah, especially that first aid station is, is a neat experience. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The start's epic too. I mean, and everyone's obsessed with city on a hill coffee roasters. Yeah. They have the best breakfast burritos. I got that hat on right now. Actually. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that place. Yeah. So I just got home from that last night. Yep. So we are, um, I am only seven days post Bigfoot mm-hmm. 200 right now. Yep. Yep. Wow. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about Bigfoot, Bigfoot 200, right? Mm-hmm. You ready to dive into that? Let's dive in and maybe share why you weren't there. Why yes. you decided that, you know what, Sally? You, you got, got this. this one. <laughs> You're good. You've done two. You don't need me. Last two, you made it. So I'm going to sit this one out. <laughs> No. Yeah. I think for, it was just another like five days that we would have been away from the kids and we, that's just too much. I mean, they survived the first two and, and, but it's a yeah. lot to ask. With for the help them. of your incredible parents. Yes. My your parents, parents are amazing. My brother and sister they, step in. Yeah. yeah it, it, I think just for us, you know, both of us being gone. Um, we another, don't like to do that too much. Yeah. Another six, five, six days was, mm-hmm. uh, and they're cute because they're 15 and 17. And you'd think they'd be like, party, mom and dad are gone. Yeah. But like we have such a tight knit relationship with our kids that they're like, wait, how many days are you going to be gone? Wait, when are you going to be gone? And they're like texting us. And I don't know. I, I, I think that we've cultivated that over the years where we sit down and have dinner together as a family at least five nights a week. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a big deal to us. Like mm-hmm. we, we really make that an event in our home and just our day to day. I think ever since, especially since you have not been a teacher the last few years and you've really taken on this, um, different roles in the company, I feel like you've been able to even more so just be at home. Like we're, we're there before they leave in the morning. We're having breakfast and coffee while they're getting ready for school. And, um, we're at every single sporting event. And so I think when we're not around, both of us are gone for more than two days. It's it kind of throws them off a little bit. Yeah, and definitely. so and when we don't like to miss their stuff, they're they're both doing so much in their everyday lives, and we just that's what we choose for our family. We like to be present. Yeah, it was a hard decision because I definitely wanted to to be there at Bigfoot, but it was I, hard for you. I don't even think. Yeah, you kept bringing that up. Well, I felt like you were a little stressed. Yeah, about I mean, it. I, my plan originally was to go. I mean, remember having those meetings with Leo, who ended up crewing for you. He Leo Fung, yeah, amazing guy. We we man, it's, it was a few months prior talking about you know how we're gonna make that happen, and he was gonna meet us there, and um, so it was kind of a game time decision, you know, to not to not end up going and staying back, but you know it worked out. But yeah, it was it was stressful, not being there, I think, well, someone asked me, is it harder to be there to witness what you're going through and to see you in the aid stations coming in, how you're coming in and, or is it more stressful, like being away? (laughs) Like, you know, because there's two very big stresses there, right? Totally. And someone was asking what one is more stressful. Mm -hmm. And I think being away is more stressful 
Like, Mm -hmm. because I, especially for this one, I had no idea Mm -hmm. at times for like 24 hours, like what was going on, you know, because the the coverage and the cell stuff, like I just didn't have any access to updates. So that was stressful. Um, But we had Joe step in, Joe Corsione, right? Yeah. From Everyday Ultra Podcast. He's the host of that. Great guy. And Leo Fung, who I met and ran like 20 miles with at Cocodona Cocodona. 250. And he, it was essentially a stranger Mm -hmm. and started to talk to me about the Triple Crown and let me know that he had been out there for many years. He knew the course. Yeah. Um, and the more I talked to him, I was like, this guy has like an Einstein brain. This, yeah. he was, he is very smart, like brilliant. At one point when I, uh, I, I texted the group, I'm like, Hey, how's she doing? Any updates? Like I woke up one morning yeah. and he said something in the text. I had no idea. I, I've never heard that word in my life. <laughs> <laughs> He's like the feet of whatever. And she's yeah. something about the stomach. I was like, yeah, I got to look that word up. Okay. So if you ever crew, Bigfoot 200, you are going to be driving anywhere between 700 and 900 miles to crew. Leo didn't use Google Maps once. That's crazy. So just so you guys know, that's how brilliant this guy is. Like his mind is next level. So the more I got to know him and and he had offered like, yeah, I can help crew. I can know my way around. And I knew at that time you were going to crew. And I was like, this would be a great guy to help Eddie out. Because Eddie gets lost going to his house. This would be a great guy to have. Wow. You're finally admitting. No, I knew you were going to probably say it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if Eddie's telling me a story and we're driving home from the grocery store, we're getting lost on the way home, even though it's a mile and a half away. <laughs> but yeah, Leo is great. And, and Joe too. I mean, Joe's been in the ultra scene for a while and he's, you know, crude and paced so much. So, but both these guys didn't know each other. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They met at the race. They and got then to ended know each up, other though. Oh, ended up being like best friends. That yeah. was amazing. Yep. It's hard not to when you're spending every waking moment for like four days straight with each right. other, right? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, that's why I didn't go. It's, it's not because I didn't want to. I had to. Well, not had to. I stayed Well, back. also, what did you do? What did I do? Oh, man. Well, it was, uh, let's see. You know, what, I have a funny story, actually. It's going to be <laughs> shocking. Well, I have two things that are going to shock okay. you. That so, means this is my first time hearing yeah, it. Definitely. So here we go. So I went for a run the Friday you started. Okay. And and where were you? Where was I? I where did you do that? I run? went down to the beach and ran. Mm-hmm. And you inspired me because I was like, if Sally's going to run for the next eighty hours, I can go run for an hour. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to run for an hour. Love that's it. the first shock for you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Maybe that's not a shock, but it's not. I did you it three days in a row. Pretty good about Is running. That a shock? Yeah. Three, no. One hours in a row. Anyways, yeah. I was running and I was going down this this like little downhill in this path Mm -hmm. and these two girls kind of looked at me and I was probably going like five minute pace like right that I I was just gonna say (laughs) were you at your five minute pace at that point just like your normal it was like they were kind of a blur because I was going so fast but (laughs) (laughs) I actually like I caught them kind of like you sense sense that people are yeah like, they were like checking you out you had your shirt They're off like, dude look at that guy's wow. form like that guy is, look at his abs he's a runner his cut tries I, yes. everything uh, yep yeah so I like stopped just past them because I was like out of breath and so I'm like, <laughs> 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 that's not a joke that was really good. And but you had to make sure you pass them so they wouldn't see you stop, right? right. How many of you guys do I, that? How many listeners like, I just need to pass this person so that yeah. and keep this pace and then I'll rest. <laughs> So I, I stop and, and one of the girls comes like, starts walking towards me and she goes, Eddie. Oh, so walking pace. And she was able to catch you. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty, much. Pretty much. You could at least said she jogged over. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, the, this is the second shocking part is mm. that someone actually recognized me, <laughs> said Eddie. And I was like, what? Yeah. Hey, what? So I took out my headphones. Yeah. Anyways, long story short, <laughs> is this this girl, um, Chelsea and her friend Nikki, they, uh, mm-hmm. they, one of them lives close by, but the girl Chelsea I was talking to, she said that, you know, she knows, she follows you mm-hmm. and she's like, oh my gosh, I thought that was you. And, you know, and so I asked, you know, yelled out your name and she goes, she was just saying, you know, some nice things about you and mm-hmm. how she was rooting for you as you were starting Bigfoot and. 
anyway, she's asked her. She was a runner. She's like, yeah, I'm doing my first, uh, I think she said the Avalon 50. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's awesome on Catalina Island. Yeah. That's it's her first ultra? Ultra, yeah. She said she's oh, doing heck yeah. the Long Beach Marathon to prep for it. And, oh, I love but anyways, it. it was kind of fun to... While you were racing Bigfoot, this this girl stopped me yeah. and said she was cheering for you. And that is so cool. Anyways, so I thought that was I a funny. I love it. Your debonair smile caught her, yeah. caught her attention. It was that or the pace. I don't know. There's a <laughs> couple I'm things. Thinking, that, I, I think the pace first. The pace probably. Pace first. <laughs> I so love that. It's And that's the that, that community that we love, too. I love that she knew she could just come up and talk to you, too. Yeah. I meet people all the time, and sometimes people will message me like, I was at this event, but I was like too shy to talk to you. I don't want to bother you. I'm like, Oh my goodness. Mm. You never bother me. I promise you. Once you meet me and start talking to me for 10 seconds, you'll realize I'm like any other Joe Schmo, like just a normal human being. Mm-hmm. I love that, that you guys were able to connect while yeah. I was racing. That's really cool. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. But yeah, other than that, ran a few miles. I think I didn't do much. Yeah. I mean, five minute pace in an hour. I mean, you were you definitely got at least <laughs> 10 miles in at least, you know, All so right, super moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay. But seriously, let's talk the, the race. Um, mm-hmm. so this race, Bigfoot 200 was 17 days after Tahoe. Mm-hmm. How were you feeling? going into that 17 days after what you went through and all the stuff that you just talked about that you did Mm -hmm. like race day. Yeah. I think the initial opinion of the two races was, you know, it was, I had a very strong coach's mindset about it. In fact, at Tahoe 200, after we crossed the finish line, we were back at the hotel with Tyler and Drew And they wanted to do a interview with me because yes, there is a Tahoe 200 film coming out. Um, It's probably coming out like in the next six weeks. But I I told Eddie, I told the guys, I was like, listen, I'm sick. Like my body is so beat up. You know, I, I redlined to get that third place finish. I know my body needs to heal. It needs to rest. I'm not going to do Bigfoot 200. And then by the time we were in Sedona, you and I are laying by the pool. And I said, well, it's, it is very hard to think about. There's other people who just did Tahoe that I met mm-hmm. that are going to Bigfoot 200. And I had chatted with, you know, a few guys that are like, yeah, dude, we're hiking it. Like we want to finish the triple crown because these guys, you know, they're, they're competing in the triple crown. And th- they too are well aware, like it's extreme. You know, this is not ideal. I I would, I don't care what distance it is, like putting a max effort 17 days apart, you're going to feel that your body isn't going to be hundred percent. You have to choose which one you're going to go hundred percent at. And so I thought maybe I can hike it and, you know, we'll, we'll drop the effort level. So that helps. So you drop your intensity. Um, The intensity therefore is just in the duration, which is still a lot. I mean, Mm -hmm. we're looking at, Uh, Bigfoot 200 is coined as the toughest in the whole series. It's 210 miles or like 208 and a half or something like that. But 210 miles, it's about 42,000 feet of climbing and descending. Um, But the terrain is very rugged, very extreme conditions. You are out there. And so you have a lot of these different factors that are going to intensify your experience. And for us too, we had heat. I think the last day um, it got up to 100 degrees. Mm. And the race ends with a half marathon on the road. I don't think people understand that. Uh, it's, it's brutal to come out of the mountains and then have to pound pavement. And it's like rolling pavement too. From start to finish, it has been the toughest race that I have done yet. But I think my perception of it was intensified because of how I was feeling physically. Yeah. So everything just felt harder. Mm. Everything felt much more challenging. And I was not 100% um, healed. You know, my immune system was not healed when I got to the start line. So the two days before the race, I'm at a Taylor Swift concert till 2 Mm a.m. And, you know, that's something we got in tickets a long time ago. I, I, I feel like I even had the tickets before I knew I was doing Bigfoot. And it just was not an ideal situation, but what was ideal was spending that time with Mackenzie and my mm. best friend and our daughters. And so when I arrived in Washington, so Bigfoot takes place around Mount St. Helens, which is just beautiful. 
a lot of the trails that we run on are permitted. So like nobody gets to go on them. A lot of it is horse path and dirt bike path. So it's not a lot of switchbacks. It's just straight up like 30 and 40% inclines for miles and miles. Like you are literally like nose to the trail climbing up some of these things because they're so steep and so long. So I knew that when I arrived in Washington, I was like, I'm, I'm not only going to do another extreme distance. It's like the most intense difficult course of all of them. And I definitely was a little apprehensive as far as like how to even approach it. And so I felt physically like muscles and legs and stuff like that. Like I was fine. My feet, um, you know, I had to do a lot of preventative taping on my feet before the race started. So the morning of the race, I spent about 20 minutes on my feet and I had taken my last dose of medication. I think it was actually the night before the race. So that was definitely in the back of my mind too, was just, oh man, like I don't feel like 100%. I just finished my meds. Like this is a great way to relapse. So I need to be smart. I need to really check the, you know, check myself throughout this race. I, I meet Joe and Leo, just amazing guys, immediately so helpful. I know that you played a really large role in helping them be organized and, and how to interact with me and stuff that I needed. I mean, it was, I, I mean, you guys were all on emails back and forth that I wasn't, that I wasn't on or wasn't, wasn't reading. You guys had your own conversations, but I could tell that you prepped them. And so that was, that really settled my heart. Cause it was hard not having you there. It was hard not having Drew and Tyler there. Yeah. Um, so Leo and Joe did all the filming for that one. The Bigfoot 200 film will be a little bit shorter, a little bit of a different style because the guys had cameras like in the aid stations. And then we actually got a lot of GoPro footage, like while I was racing, it was really neat. Just, I, I was entering into a completely different crew. I wasn't 100% feet weren't 100%. And I feel like that when we're put into those situations where it's like, I want to complete the goal that I set out for myself, I want to complete it, but I also need to be wise and I need to be flexible and understand that in order to complete this goal, I have to humble myself and put away my pride and know that this isn't going to be about getting on the podium and how fast I can do it. It is simply going to be about getting to the finish line as best as I can and I also had the hope knowing that as soon as I finish, I then got like nine weeks to recover and rest before Moab. And that's, um, well, actually, I think it's eight weeks. Yes, eight weeks. And that was something that I, that I was really banking on was then I can really have true rest, heal, all of that. And so as I stood on the start line, I made peace with that. I made peace with... We're going to enjoy this journey. I know from what everyone has said, it's the most beautiful course. And it really was just beautiful. It was such a treat to be able to run in the places that we did. I promised you, Eddie, before I left, I said, I'm going to sleep way more. Yeah. I'm going to plan to sleep. I promise that I'll eat a lot. I will take care of my body. I'll do what I need to do um, to get to that finish line as best I can. So that was... That's how we uh, approached it is we have to put the pride aside and um, be gracious knowing that like I'm not 100%, so I can't expect to be 100%. The race started and I'd say that the most flat in downhill, there was a lot of flat in downhill the first 40 miles and um, you're going to laugh. I wasn't expecting this at all, but I, the flat and the downhill is where I was able to, to breathe the best. I was having trouble breathing. It was an extreme altitude. I think the highest we ever got was like 6,800 feet. And I don't really ever have a tough time until I go past 8,500 feet. And so I was, you know, I was fine there, but I think my lungs and everything just we, I really struggled on the climbs. I just struggled breathing and was, my system was just tired. So the first 40 miles, 
I didn't even realize, I think I was leading overall at one point, like at one point I was first overall and downhill running is my strength. I have a little tactic whenever I run downhill, especially at the beginning of the race for my entire career. I've, you know, I don't struggle with sore legs after a race ever. My legs are very strong. You know, I don't get the IT band stuff. Like I can bomb hard down downhills for an entire race and be fine for other people. That is like just a recipe for disaster. Bombing downhills in the beginning of the race means you're going to be barely walking at the end of the race. Like there's definitely strategy and we all know what our personal strengths and weaknesses are. And my greatest strength is, is downhill running. But one of the things that I do is I have this little thing I tell myself whenever I downhill run and it's just no energy, no energy, no energy, no energy. And what that means is I let my feet flow and glide, but I never push the pace. So I don't, give any energy to the downhill, but I just let my legs do what they want to do. I'm like fearless. Like I'm, I don't care if it's rocky terrain or a rugged terrain. Like I just go because of that, like my heart rate drops. Like I always keep, I'll be checking my heart rate. My heart rate usually drops to a, a low rate. And then if there's flats, I just kind of cruise a flat. So because that was my strength, I was just flowing. I was having so much fun. We were crossing over like little streams and, um, you could really see Mount St. Helens. And then a couple girls, the top two girls who eventually became first and second, both Mika and Eliza and Eliza, um, race Cocodona 250 as well. But Eliza and I have known each other for over a decade and we've shared miles at Western States and UTMB. And she is just such a lovely person and a friend of mine. So we shared a lot of miles together. And I'd say that was like one of my favorite first 40 miles was like one of my favorite parts of the entire race because of the people that I shared it with. I had great conversation. So for me, if you were following the track, you were like, holy crap, like, what is she doing? Like going out so hard. But for me personally, that was the easiest effort of the entire race for me. And I was always checking in on, on that heart rate. Yeah. It's funny because I, I did get a few texts, uh -huh. um, when, you know, probably that first 30 ish miles and with people knowing that you were trying to go up and will approach this race and Relaxed. Yeah, a relaxed way. And you said, you're just going to hike it, hike mm -hmm. it in. Let's get the finish and move on. And then I'm getting texts are like, is she going a little faster than <laughs> she thought she would be? Yeah, or is definitely. she pushing the pace a little bit more with like the eye roll? Like, oh yeah, yeah just walking this one in. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Got a lot of that. I didn't know what place I was in. I was never aware of that until a spectator was like, you're first overall. And I was like, what? No, I'm not. But there was other races going on. There's mm. other distances. There was a 40 mile race. So you don't know like who's in what. And I, I just didn't care. I wasn't paying yeah. attention. Like it wasn't important to me. And I also feel that when we're racing, another really good way to gauge your effort is settling in with somebody. And yeah. if you're like having a conversation and you're laughing, I mean, that's what we were doing. Eliza and I, we were laughing and talking and you wanted to do this. Like there's lots of places to fill up our filtered bottles. And so we are stopping, filling up our bottles and chatting. And like when we go in and out of aid stations, like maybe one of, one of the three of us would like change shoes. And so someone would lead out of the aid station or someone would stop a little bit longer in a stream and then we'd catch up. So I think I was always hopping around first and third quite mm -hmm. a bit for the first 40 miles, but I was laughing and smiling and having so much fun. Hillary Yang, Billy's wife was out there shooting. And so is Sarah Tarr, who are very good friends of mine. And so like I was stopping, giving them hugs and chatting with them. And then when I got to the aid station, the second aid station, like, you know, chatting with people in there and just hanging out with Leo and Joe, like I was having such a great time. I did know that we were then going to start doing some really intense climbing. Mm -hmm. And I was aware that that would probably be the point where I would just have some struggles with breathing. Yeah. And then as the race went on to just the duration of it. So the time spent on my feet, you know, might might be a little, little rough for the system that was trying to heal. So the first 40 miles were very fun. It was very relaxed for me. I think once I made my way into the night, it got really cold. I got lost a couple of times started to realize that I was probably a little bit more tired than I thought. So I was a little like delusional about where I was. Like I was on the side of this mountain, like there wasn't a trail all around me. Mm. And I like realized like, what am I, 
what am I doing? And it wasn't like a long time that I was off trial. I was probably like five minutes, but I had to work my way all the way back. And thank goodness we, everyone carries a topo map on their phone and you can see where you are in relation to the trail. And so, you know, I had to find my way, go all the way back to where I had, I had gone off trail and start from there and then get back on the trail again. And I found another runner who was so gracious. I think he could tell that I wasn't doing very well. It was, this is probably like 10 o'clock at night by now. And he was like, I'm, I'm staying with you. Hmm. He's like, do you feel safe? Do you feel okay? Like kept on like checking in. He was such a sweetheart. And it, I think at one point too, he gave me some water. I kept on saying, I'm just so thirsty. I'm so thirsty. And I don't even know what that was about, but that time. So that was the first night around 10 o'clock. I slowly, I stopped eating. Hmm. I remember just being really dizzy I remember every single climb was very hard and just, I'd feel my heart rate go up and I would just, I just felt so tired and it wasn't even like, you know, like you had a hard workout and your muscles are sore. It was like this intense, deep fatigue, mm. like, like from like deep within me. I don't even know how to explain it. Like I was deeply tired, but my whole body just ached and like your body was saying, hey, remember we just did Coca Dona and Tahoe? Right. <laughs> remember we just raced 17 that? days ago yeah. and um, you literally just finished meds? Like, yeah. hey, what are we doing? I, I do feel like from that point on, so that was 10 o'clock at night, that Friday night, that my body was like, we're not giving you what you want. Mm. Like, this is not okay. And I, I think um, I know my body very well. I think I take very good care of my body overall. Mm -hmm. Like from a, a big picture point of view, I do. I mean, I take like two months off for an off season. I haven't been injured in over a decade. Like I, I'm, I'm typically a, I, I'm very happy about how strong I am yeah. as a runner. And I, I try to do my best to recover, but I am also aware that this season of 200s and the way these two races fell in, I wasn't surprised that I was feeling that way. Yeah. But mentally, even though physically I was breaking down mentally, I was 110% like we're finishing this yeah. and I know I'm not going to get back what I want. And I know there's probably going to be struggles as, as we move on, but there is one goal in, line, in mind and that is get to the finish line. And so we're just going to keep charging. And so I did a lot of little things that helped tether me. That um, was the first night you're having. That was the first night. And I think. Um, because I stopped eating, I think I, I stopped drinking too, but I knew if I could just stay with this guy or I'd always like make sure I stayed with people because when you're by yourself and you're struggling and you don't feel good, it's very easy to turn inward mm -hmm. and actually slow down. Like you don't even know how slow you're going because you're just thinking about your whole focus is on, I don't feel good. Yeah. Your whole focus is on, oh my gosh, I'm doing terrible. How am I going to get the next aid station? And what those things that you tell yourself that you focus on, they affect your physical. And so I realize I need to be surrounded by people so I can focus on conversation, focus on other people and like keep up the pace that they're moving at too. So I had fallen back. I mean, I had been passed quite a bit at this point. I get into the aid station and according to Joe and Leo, so they later told me this, I was not talking in an organized way. Mm. I remember being very, very cold and very thirsty. Like I was so, so thirsty. I just wanted water. I said, I need to sleep. And I slept for over two hours in that aid station. I woke up, they tried giving me food. I think I projectile vomited like six or seven times in the aid station. I became anxious because now I'd been in the aid station for almost three hours. So I was been passed by so many people. And, you know, so the race was like kind of moving on without me. And it's easy to feel like, oh my gosh, how, how now how much closer am I to cut off times? Yeah. Um, thankfully in the beginning there in these 200s, like it was many, 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 many hours. Like I was ahead of cutoff times, but when you're not in the right state, you don't think about that. And so, um, I changed my clothes into warmer clothes and Joe started to pace me in that first section. He really got me moving well. I tried eating little tiny bits at that point. And so I got a little bit of food and we got to the next aid station. I was still nauseous. We are now like the sun is rising and you can feel like it's going to be a hot day. And so I change, get out of like my, I think I had like pants and a sweat, a long sleeve shirt. We get out of that. We, we continue on again. And 
this time it, it's just a lot more difficult for me to eat. So Saturday, I'd say I spent all of the 24 hours of Saturday vomiting and um, having a hard time even with water. Like I always wanted just fresh water and I would throw it up every time. So I had to have something in the water, some type of electrolyte. So that's similar to what happened at Tahoe then, yeah? Yeah, I think, I think Tahoe... I completely fried my body because I was sick. I was so sick. I mean, I, I, my body was on fire yeah. and I couldn't process anything, which is why they had to keep me in the aid station for so long at Tahoe as well. But I was very aware of that. I was aware of like some of the similarities of Tahoe and, and what was going on there. And I accepted that. I accepted the fact that, okay, I didn't enter this 100%. My body's like really angry that I'm, I'm trying to do anything. So I think it was just a constant game of, of troubleshooting. I knew like I need to eat something. So even though I was nauseous, like I was always trying to eat something. I was always trying to get the calories in, but we really struggled. I think at one point Joe said, yeah, those 24 hours, like you maybe had 400 calories. Yikes. And that was pretty amazing to me because I remembered at Tahoe just being so grateful that my body can still move on so little. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the while I was, I was hopeful, like we're going to eventually eat. We will. Cause sometimes you completely deplete your system when you have nothing in it, you get like a new slate, mm. you know, you get like a new, like now, now we can like kind of start from scratch because everything is out of your body. And so Joe and I went through like the really, the night two, we, it was the toughest climbing of the night. It was a 17 mile stretch with 7,600 feet of climbing. Yeah, I remember looking at the, not the graph, what is it, like online, the- Elevation profile. The, yeah, the profile. Mm -hmm. And seeing that section, I was like, oh man, yeah. that's brutal. It was so intense. I mean, I, and you're doing it at night. So you're looking at this trail through, you know, this circular lens Yeah. and, and there's no end in sight with the climbing. And like I said, this isn't footpath. Like Joe and I started to have jokes about these climbs. And I said, if, if you, as a friend, we're like, Hey Sally, let's go out on a hike. And you brought me out here. We would not be friends anymore. <laughs> like we would be enemies because this isn't even a trail that people just go on and hike yeah. on. It was like horse path. So it's this really narrow dirt, dusty, dirty trail that just went straight up the mountain. Yeah. And there was, it, it was not enjoyable. Yeah. I will say that it wasn't. And it's, it's crazy too. Cause I do big mountainous races. Um, UTMB for example, is a great example. That's like 34,000 feet of climbing in 106 miles. I mean, that's pretty aggressive, mm -hmm. but I freaking love that. Like lots of switchbacks, like the, the path has been made for humans to walk on. So even though it is difficult, it's like set there for you to do. And so it's this great challenge. We're on land that we had to get permits where people don't tread on this stuff. It's way back there. I mean, it's this, this very remote trail. And a lot of the second half of the race is like that. Like you're just like, where am I? Like, when is this going to end? And it is just steep straight up the whole time. So as we, that, that second night we did that hardest climbing, then we descended into the aid station about an hour before the sun rose. And my first thought when we got into that aid station was I need to take care of my feet. I have very obvious problems right now. Yeah. So was that the feet. first time that you sat down? And yeah. So, on. so we're like a day and a half in. So these races start at 9am. So it's kind of weird because, you know, when they say, okay, starting day two, it's like, They'll say starting day two at midnight. And you're like, dude, we've only been out here for like 12 hours, yeah. you know? Um, I think they even said that like when I finished day five and I was like, well, I wasn't out there for five days. It was only yeah. 87 hours. Like right. it's just the days start like so late. And so I remember feeling like, wow, we're not, we're not even that far into this race and there's stuff going on with my feet. But here is, was the crux of the greatest challenge, I think that, I had a hard time even talking to my crew about it because it was, it, it was me facing a great frustration that I didn't want to be in, that I couldn't change, that I had to accept as part of finishing this, this series. And 
I started to get some pretty intense nerve pain in my toes. And I've never had that in my life, but I knew it was like an overuse thing. And, you know, even as a coach, as I said earlier, it's like, you know, you're going to get something. If you're going to push your body and beat it up like this, yeah. like you're here, you have to deal with the consequences mm -hmm. of that decision. And I had to own that, you know, I had to own that there's going to be stuff that's going to come out. Mm -hmm. So I've never dealt with it. I know nerve pain can kind of be all over the place. It could be like a numbness. Um, it could feel like fire. It can feel like stabbing. So what I dealt with from that point on was, and I, I'm trying to think like what mileage we were at at that point. I want to say it was like 88 miles in maybe, or like, no, I think we were at, we were at the hundred mile point. The nerve pain was shooting up through my two big toes and it just felt like someone was shoving a knife mm. up through the bottom of my big toes. I also felt like my four other toes were just on fire. And my two baby toes were completely shredded. So I had like blisters on them and then they were just completely shredded. But those had been shredded since Cocodona. Those have had a hard time to heal like this entire time. They got shredded again at Tahoe. And then I started to develop blisters like around the backs and sides of, of my heel. And so the blisters, I felt it was really funny. I was like almost apathetic about the blisters, like whatever the blisters. But I was like, every time I came to see a medic, so I saw a medic three times and all three of them tried to work on my feet in a very different way. I brought up the nerve pain and I said, this is so intense like, I feel like my feet are on fire and that someone is simultaneously stabbing me through the bottom of my big toes. What can we do to change that? How can we alleviate that? And every single medic would look at me with like the biggest eyes of compassion and just say, there's nothing you can mm. do. Like, that's like, we can't change that. I'm so sorry. Like you would have to stop. And I thought, one, I'm really frustrated that the feet have been the issue this whole series. You know, you, you have your whole career where you're taking great care of your feet. You've done everything right. Never had to, to be an issue. And now it's just like compounding every race. Like every race, they're not 100% healed. So it's just a matter of time before like something explodes in them. And then I have to make that a part of my race, whether I want to or not. And as the race went on, I actually was thinking about that. I was thinking about that, even how we um, relate to it in everyday life. Like sometimes we're in seasons and it's such a frustrating season. And no matter how hard we work or how hard we try, or we try to maneuver, do something better, do something different. It's like, we stay in that, we stay in that frustration and we're, we're forced to work through things that maybe we don't want to work through or, or through things that maybe we thought had been healed or settled. And I just started to really kind of work through that, like in my heart, even just what is this, what is this going to be for you as you move through the race? Are we just going to focus on that frustration then? Is that going to be the dictator and leader um, and energy? Is all that energy going to go into your feet? And it was very hard to not focus on the feet because it's like I couldn't take a step mm -hmm. without it screaming at me. So I resorted back into what I did at Cocodona. And that was... I would have to tell, so Joe paced me the entire time. He paced me for a hundred miles over 20,000 feet. I was like 25,000 feet of climbing. I mean, basically did a race, a hundred mile race. Yeah, that's nuts. And he was incredible. Like if you don't know Joe Cassion, like he is like the most joyful, positive, kindest person. He's got a great um, podcast called Everyday Ultra. Um, he's had me on a guest there a couple of times, but he was such a joy and a, a force as a pacer and had just the right balance of, you know, we got to keep moving mm. and, and let's do our best here. Let's try here. And also very compassionate. Mm. And so I think without him, I kept telling him I would have moved much slower on that. I, it probably would have taken me over a hundred hours to finish that. Yeah. But I would tell him each time I was like, listen, Joe, I, I hate that I'm even saying this, but I just, I need a few minutes to think about and embrace what's going on with my feet. And then I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But it was hard because like, if we hit like a rocky section, oh my gosh, it mm. was like, I wanted to cry. Yeah, You know, like I just was like, this is 
horrible. And, and the way that I was relating the pain too, is like, I knew that once I stopped that I would be fine. Like then I would just heal and it'd be a matter of time. You know, it wasn't like I was dealing with rhabdo. It wasn't like I ripped a hamstring or like I had rolled my ankle, which we see that in races all the time. And like those situations, like your race is done. Like it's a bummer, but Um, and I've, I've had many races where I've had to DNF or I've, I've dropped out because it's like, you know, some of the, the medical stuff and health stuff, like you don't want that to take you out for your whole year or alter, you know, your, your career or your whole racing season. The things that I've been dealing with are like, it's during the race. It's, it's when I want to push and when I want to do what I want to do and I'm not able to do that. And so I'm just experiencing a lot of frustration, but within that frustration, it's pain that I can't change. And it's, it's pain associated with that situation that I'm in and that I am either going to deal with and endure, or I'm just going to say, Hey, like I'm done with this. And for me, I'm making that personal choice. It's very personal to me to accomplish the goal that I set out to do and asking myself, how much Sally can you endure to get to that finish line? How much are you going to put up with to get to that finish line? And, and also teaching myself the power in focusing on one simple thing. You know, I had said earlier that I went up to, to hang out with Cam Haynes, who, um, some of you guys might know he is a bow hunter. I know there's a lot of controversy about him as a bow hunter, but I learned so much from him. And that guy has such a great heart, great soul. So grateful to call him a friend. And I, that was my first time ever picking up a bow. You know, we have like these little targets out in the field, but what I learned from him was that, the only way I was going to hit that target was by laser focusing on this teeny tiny little dot. Like you have like this sight range, you know, on the, on that bow. And it was like, I had to be so still and, and so focused on this teeny tiny dot. It was the only way I could, I could hit the target. And I think about how that relates just in life, how easy it is to be distracted by what other people are doing, to be distracted by what other people have, Or in that moment, you know, social media can be so disastrous in this way when you're in a bad place and you open up social media and you're like, her life is so great. What he's doing is so fun and exciting. Like everyone that I'm scrolling through right now is just like living the dream. And I'm in this really depressive state. I'm in this darkness. I'm in this state of frustration and stress. And like, this sucks. But what is so powerful is stopping that scrolling Stop looking to the right and the left and all the other distractions around you and focus very peacefully with patience on that one goal. And what is that? And I I found myself having to do that a lot in the second half. Sometimes the pain felt so great that, you know, I would have to sit down on a bench. There was several times I just would sit down on the ground and I would lift, literally lift my feet up in the air because it it just felt like they were on fire. And I would look up at Joe who like felt so helpless. I felt bad because there was a few times you just see it in his face. Like he wanted to help and there was nothing he could do. And for those of you that have been in that position, whether as, you know, as a parent or a partner or, you know, in a race, like it's hard to be in a position where you can't help someone that's hurting and you're just sitting there watching it. Mm. And I think Joe kind of felt that a couple of times. Like I would just look up and, and I'd just say, I, I just need to sit here for a minute, Joe. I just need to like cool the feet down and just kind of have a pity party. And so I ended up sleeping, I think probably like four hours. Um, I had to take a lot more like seated breaks and all of that had to do with just me working through the discomfort. And, and again, like I could, I knew I was getting sicker as the time went on. So I started throwing up more. I started coughing up a ton more phlegm and blowing my nose. I mean, I was just, I was essentially falling apart the closer I got to the finish line. What was that pain? You said you was nerve pain in your feet. What was that pain like compared to the Cocodona when your blisters were new? Mm -hmm. Cocodona was was a little different because as the miles went on, I could, I could feel like my flesh being ripped Mm. open. That was like a sensation that like kind of made me cringe because you know me, like I, I can't, 
stand watching other people in pain is really hard for me. Like yeah. seeing wounds and blood, like I don't do well with that stuff at all. And I could, I could envision what was going on in my feet. And that was, so it was like the mental and physical pain of that was really hard to, to, to not think about. Mm -hmm. So those were like flesh wounds. Like my feet were like bleeding and, you know, I just had open sores all over my feet. This was, yeah, I probably had like 10 blisters. Um, like I said, that I was very apathetic about, I was just like, whatever, dude. And then the pinkies were, were definitely like my pinky toes, even now still, they're pretty raw mm -hmm. and they don't look good. But then the nerve pain was, it was weird. I've never felt that in my life. Um, at first I thought like I had a hot spot on the bottoms of my toes and then it, it started to increase as it went on, but it's weird to feel something that no one else can see. Yeah. I don't even know how to relate to that, but I think that's also what brought great frustration because originally when I took off my shoes and socks to look at it and I don't see anything there, I was like, what? <laughs> like, what do you, like, what is this? And then like, I started to like touch my toes and kind of like move around and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's that's nerve stuff. Mm. Like that's no joke. Yeah, I mean, like that stuff you don't mess around I'm with. Trying to relate here. This is a probably not the best, but <laughs> when you have a big smile like that on your face, I'm just so <laughs> excited to hear the comedy no, that's going to come out. <laughs> remember, remember a couple of years ago when I was running that half marathon, and I had like I could have sworn there was a rock in my oh, shoe. Yeah. Remember? And I'm yeah, running. it was like a neuroma. Yeah, and I was yeah, like, in your I got to stop. So I had to stop. I took my mm -hmm. shoe off and my sock, and I was like, what is going on? There's nothing here. It's really common it was right like there. A, a nerve thing. Yeah, it's that's really weird. It's very painful. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of listeners have had metatarsal stuff, which is very common for runners. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has destroyed people's running careers. You know, people sometimes have to stop running because of that. There's extreme metatarsal pain, neuromas in between. I mean, there's not a lot you can do to change that. Mm. I think as we got closer to the finish line, so we're now like 180 miles in, I realized that there's a potential for some pretty significant damage that I'm doing to my feet. Like that mm. was always in the back of my head. You know, how much of this is just right now, it's an overuse, my body's angry and it's going to go away. You know, am I foolish for continuing on, especially in something that I don't understand? And that's why I talked to three different medics mm -hmm. throughout the race. And one of them brought me a bit of hope. She's like, you know, you do have, you know, some extra skin around like this, this side of your, the, uh, on both of my feet, I have extra skin, like next to my big toe. She's like, I could shave that down. And I think it would, you know, it would help. And she's like, you know, like when you stop, like it'll probably just heal and, and go away. So did she shave it down? No, no. no. I mean, there you was so much. Of, yeah, no. I think like at that point too, I think we had like 50 miles left in the race. And I was just like, I just tape yeah. up. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Like I just, I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. She was the third person to mm -hmm. deal with my feet. The second medic was, I think they actually got this on film. It's, it's low key embarrassing. I think I was like 130, 140 miles into the race. I had this massive blister on my baby toe. And then it was like on the inside of the baby toe. And then all around the baby toe, it was just raw skin. And it had been wrapped in this blisters, like pushing all the way out of the bandage. Like mm -hmm. it was so big. And I didn't know that she was going to pop it. And she had like this tool to pop it. It wasn't just a sweet little like safety pin. It was like, it looked like a little like pocket knife almost thing. Yeah. And I yelled in the aid station so loud. Wait, before she did it or right? Like as she's doing oh, it. Okay. Cause then I also, I, I think she accidentally cut me too. Oh, There's yeah. like blood everywhere. She's and like, hey, Bob, bring me your pocket knife. Yeah, I seriously. Got one over here. But she was so lovely too. Yeah. Like she was so precious. Like she was like massaging like my, the yeah. arches of my feet and like trying to like, yeah. like calm me down. Yeah. And but I think the like I was like really upset at that point too because I was like I can't believe that we're dealing with this. Like I was just like yeah. so angry, you know. And the person who had taped my feet before probably wasn't like the best taping job. And so he had used Luco tape to just tape right over some of these blisters. Like that was it. And so she's like, well, the tape is attached to your blister Ugh. and, and I'm trying to maneuver it around. And so like one of the blisters she popped by pulling the tape on it and mm. you have so many nerve 
endings in your feet. It's crazy how a teeny tiny blister on your toe can hurt so bad. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's comical. You look at it and you're like, how is that causing so much pain? But nerve endings are no joke. Like that is like, it's just a next level. It's very different from like a cut. Yeah. And so by the time the third medic had gotten to my feet, they were, they were pretty beat up. And so she was just trying to like comfort me mm. and we continued on. We're about, um, you know, we're getting through to the last aid station before the finish line. Um, I think I had stopped to s sleep on a log. I think I, I even stopped and Joe and I both sat down on the ground and I leaned against him and fell asleep. Yeah. Up, up um, to that point, how, how much have you slept? By this time, I probably had slept almost four hours. Four. So it was a long time. Like Which, it was like, not really. Four it hours. is. If you're racing, most of the time, if you're racing up top, you're not sleeping. And if you yeah, do, it's a total of less than you an hour. You went in saying, I'm going to sleep more. Yeah. I'm gonna, yes. So four is not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I get it. If you're like top. Yeah. Cause not. I mean, I, I don't even, I didn't sleep very much at Tahoe at all. Right. Um, so I think the, as we neared that, that last aid station before the finish line, I was very happy that we had gotten that far. I remember having a, um, I had finally all, that day, that whole day I'd gotten my appetite back. So I was eating, oh my gosh, and you guys need to try this, mashed potatoes with broth, with like chicken broth was life to my soul. I mean, that was like, I had several cupfuls of that. And then second to last aid station, I had a full on cheeseburger. Like I was eating a lot. Yeah. Really, really grateful. I think um, every aid station is so funny. There was an aid station starting at like mile 80, that had LaCroix sparkling water, which is one of my favorite things to have after a hot long run. Oh, yeah. Like I'll drink like two or three cans of that stuff. Like, right. I don't know why I crave that. It's just like my thing. But, but when I had entered that aid station, I was, I was so nauseous. I didn't take one. And then I remember asking every single aid station from then on out if they had sparkling water and everyone would look at me like, no, <laughs> but everyone would offer me Fresca. And I was like, oh, yeah. that is not the same as sparkling water. That's yeah. like sugar-free, like, like flavored You're soda, basically. To a, a sparkling water diva here. That is no <laughs> sparkling water. It's not. It's like diet soda. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So Leo, our amazing crew chief, that second to last aid station, well, the last aid station before the finish line. He comes in with a whole case of LaCroix. Nice. I was like, you are the man, Leo. You win, Leo. Heck yeah. Like I immediately drank down one can. I think I ended up having like one and a half cans of mm -hmm. that. I had a cheeseburger. Like I was so happy. I was like, we're going to finish this thing. And Eliza, my good friend, Eliza, had already been done for 20 hours. So she finished Jeez. second place. Um, Mika was the first place finisher. But you, ha as you leave that um, last aid station on your way to the finish line, you're going toward, you have like a mile and a half of country road and then you hit the road. Yeah. And it was over a hundred degrees that day. Yep. Now I, I love the heat. I do well on the heat, but obviously when you're out in the elements for several days, like your body's broken down, it's weary, it's tired. It hasn't had the sleep that it needs. It hasn't had the amount of food that it needs. And I remember at that point we were inside the forest. Now the thing about Bigfoot 200 is because it is so rugged, you are encountering routes that nobody ever goes on that are not maintained. Mm -hmm. I am not kidding when I say that we had to either climb over or climb under at least 100 redwood trees. <sighs> I mean, my legs, you've seen my legs. Yeah. Are, are, I have so many scratches. bruises and like deep scratches. I'm just ripped up from climbing over and under these trees. The other thing that I didn't realize was after I had my really big solid taping job was this is so comical to an annoying degree was I had to cross four rivers right after. And the first two were pretty calm and I was able to find rocks and jump and, you know, use my gymnastic skills to get across yeah. without getting my feet wet. And I was so proud of myself. I was like, heck yeah. yeah. What's up now water. <laughs> and then I get to number three and it was a roaring, when I say roaring river, like I was legit afraid to get a lot across cause there was no rope. There was like no rope. There was nothing to get across. You know it was going to be like an issue when the guy's like handing out life jackets. Like, hey, <laughs> good luck on this one. That one I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm like a strong person. I have good balance and coordination. 
that moment, I was legit concerned about the rest of the field. You're about to test your swim game right now. I was, but I was also like, dude, what about like the people crossing this yeah. at night? I cross it in the day. Yeah. Crossing this at night. Yeah, they're just tired. They're, they're tired. Exhausted, they're... Maybe the elderly that are like, that, that don't have anything to hang on to. Like that could be super dangerous. Yeah, like, you're right. So I, I start wading across. I'm like, well, <laughs> here go the feet. Like, so I start wading across and I slipped. And I was able to catch myself, but the water was like rushing and I only had a few more steps. Knee deep or what was it? Um, Almost up to my waist. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was, no, it was up to my waist. Cause I remember thinking my phone, yeah, that's what it was. My phone was in the pocket in my pack. And I remember thinking I can't get my phone wet. And so I got across that. And then the fourth one, which was like a half mile later was just very wide and it was a little bit more peaceful. I mean, it, it was, it was moving, but it wasn't going to throw you down. Yeah. And that one was just about at my, at my thighs. Okay. And so that was insane. Like that was so many parts of this race were, were just rugged and like rough that on one hand, that's what made the adventure so great mm. is like, dude, this is a rough, like yeah. awesome course that people don't get to be out here. Yeah. And it was beautiful. Oh, I'm sure. But I think for me, I also had moments of like, I just felt so miserable that I was like, really mm. another crossing. <laughs> did you, did so. you try to tape up your feet after that or were yeah. you, you did again? So, um, so that section was very long and I was by myself. I told Joe, I was like, listen, I need you. Like he was like, I'll go with you. I was like, no, I need you to rest. Like oh, yeah. he had already gone like 60 miles with me. He still had 40 more to go with me. And I was like, I need your energy to be better than mine. And I, I'm really low right now. And so I need you to be stronger than me. Go eat, go sleep. And I'll see you at the next aid station. Yeah. Talk about that because you, you, you've harped on that before with me mm-hmm. about making sure I sleep and I'm eating and, like how, how important is that for the runner mm-hmm. that the crew is? I think the crew, care of? the crew definitely forgets that it, it can be detrimental to the whole crew. So if you're serving with like several other people and none of you are eating and, and sleeping, you actually start to, I mean, you forget like we're human beings, like human beings will then become groggy, irritated, more easily frustrated. You're not very pleasant to be around. And the runner depends on you. They depend on your energy. Mm -hmm. They depend on your ability to logically think through things. And sometimes if you are sleep deprived and you're hungry, you become very like irritated with little things. You just want everything to be done. You know, you just, you kind of at the state where you're like, I just want the runner to be freaking done at this race, you know, cause I, I don't feel good. And so you don't always make rational decisions, but if you are pacing and you're exhausted, like you can get your runner lost because you're tired. You can kind of get into your own head and maybe you yourself are not that pleasant or alert to be around. And so I know at one point, Joe didn't tell me till after the race, like he started hallucinating, you know, it was a long time on his feet. He yeah. basically did like a super hard hundred mm-hmm. just pacing me. Mm-hmm. And Joe is a phenomenal athlete. He's really fit and fast. And, you know, he knows how to do these tough races. So I had all confidence in him, but he's like, dude, I had to hide that from you. Cause there was a few times like he was aware of it. He yeah. was aware of his hallucinations. I think there's at one point where then you become delusional, which is what I ex- experienced at Tahoe 200, where I just didn't know where I was. And I blacked out and like, that was really scary. But for Joe, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm hallucinating. Like I'm, that isn't what it is. And he kept on trying to like snap himself out of it, take some caffeine, eat, which he did a great job of doing, but I never knew. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the race course itself, it really lent to challenging you in every single way. And there was like three times on the course that the race director wanted you to go climb to the top of a lookout. It was just a little out and back before going to the aid station. And that just messed with you mentally. Yeah. And this section was so rugged and so steep and I didn't have Joe with me. And I remember I got to the fork in the road and if you go right, you go down to the Barbie aid station, but you have to go left first and tag the summit. And this summit, the climb up to it had to be like 40% incline. And my feet were in such a bad state. I had no water. I was so thirsty. And I, and it was like, so you essentially were going out for like 0.65 
addition because, because they wanted you to see the view. The lookout. Yeah. That's what all of it was. It was like, we want you to see this lookout, but like when you're not doing well, you're like, I don't want to see that lookout. I don't freaking care about the view right now. I just want to go to the aid station and drink some water. Especially those that are doing it at (laughs) night. They're like, sweet. What do I get to see? Like nothing. Dude, two of the lookouts were at night for me. I saw blackness. Yeah. Yeah. I was was like, (laughs) awesome. I'm glad I did that. Yeah. It was so, I mean, now I can look back and like really laugh, but like these are important things to know before you go into a race, like read the descriptions, like be aware of like what you're doing because it then just makes your experience that much better. Like for me, when I do really hard races, like Badwater, for example, like I know a lot of people that just think that race is insane. I would never do it. Why would you run in 130 degree heat? And on one hand, it's like, yeah, totally. When will I ever do that again? Like in my life, but how cool to like feel what your body does and see what you're capable of doing. And like you prep and and plan and prepare for that. You, you plan to be in that really critical state. And so I feel like with Bigfoot, it was like, I knew it was going to be so difficult, but it was really interesting too, to see like a lot of my weaknesses come out, you know, when I'm tired and my irritated and I feel dehydrated, like there comes that bad attitude. It's like, I don't want to climb to a lookout. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I can look back and laugh about that, but I think it's, it's good too. Cause it shows me areas, you know, that I can grow and that I can, you know, that I can be better and just how powerful our attitudes are too. When we keep the right perspective, when we stay positive and we just understand, Hey, this is, you signed up for this. Like there's going to be surprise prizes and challenges all along the way. And some of them are well-meaning because when we did the lookout that was in the daytime, it was, it was freaking gorgeous. It was unreal how beautiful it was. And while I was doing it, I wasn't grateful for it because it was a hundred degree heat and I was only 30 miles from the finish. And you're just like, I just want to be done. But you get up there and you're like, I know why they did this because it is a very rare, unique opportunity. Like where the lookout was, like that's not where people go hiking. Yeah, nobody hikes Like that. nobody goes out there. Like they're essentially taking you. It's a privilege to be It was a at. privilege yeah. to be out there. Yeah. And so it's, it's amazing how powerful perspective can be. It's like I can be angry that like I'm so tired. It's so hot. This is another climb that's like I don't want to do. Or like I'm going to grab hold of the moment that I'm in and realize like I just saw a view that very few people people will ever see on the planet. And it was beautiful. So that was just like the constant conversation, the closer we got to the finish line. But the cool little like caveat story is we, as we continued down that country road to hit the final half marathon to the finish, my good friend, Eliza, who had finished 20 hours before comes running up the road at me. And I was like, what? are you doing? And she just wanted to give me a hug and wish me well. And, um, and she, and like her husband was like in in his car and, um, and her pacer was with her too, but she just like ran out and gave me a couple words of encouragement. And I just thought, and I told her this too. We like took a selfie. I go, I will remember this part of the race forever. Mm. Like, this is why I love our sport so much. And Eliza, if you, if you guys don't, don't know her, you, you have to give her a fall. She's very quiet, probably one of the most accomplished female ultra runners in our sport. She's been around forever and has done some amazing things and continues to do great things. But I was just telling her, this is what makes our sport so amazing. Mm. Like you finished on the podium like a day ago and you're coming back out to cheer me on and mm, check on me and make cool. sure that I'm okay. And, um, there was blackberries all along the way. So we were picking blackberries. Like I ate so many wild blackberries and then we hit an apple tree and there's all these fresh apples on the ground. So I was eating apples. Nice. <laughs> like, like this little, like little, uh, quick segment was really just a really sweet part that kind of gave me a break from the really deep discomfort that I was in, but because it was over a hundred degrees that day. So then Eliza left and Hillary Yang, who is on the media team and was doing like the live feed and she's the director of, of media and photography. She drove out. I think she was trying to see like where we were cause they were doing athlete tracking. And I think she'd let people know, like, you know, we'll, we'll do a live feed when Sally comes in to the finish. So she kind of wanted to see where we are on the road. So she drove out and she comes running over to, to Joe and I. And the first thing that she said, she was like, Oh my gosh, Sally. She's like, you, you've lost so much weight. (laughs) 
She's like, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and we, I go, I know, right. I go, I can feel it. And I would, the shorts that I was wearing, I go, I go, Hillary, these shorts are usually like, I fill these out. Like the slits on the side are open permanently when I wear these and we both like start giggling, but she was just like, so in- encouraging. Mm-hmm. And then she tells me that she had been at the track all day watching people finish and that they cracked an egg on the track. It was 124 degrees on the track. Yeah. I was watching some of the live, the live streams that she would have when people were coming in mm-hmm. and they were having, yeah, they were whatever they were measuring the, yeah. the temperature with, but yeah, it's like 125. She said her insane. laptop, her phone and a camera all overheated. Yeah, that's right. Cause they were saying they were having issues with yes. the, the YouTube live stream yeah. because their equipment kept yeah. like, failing. So that makes sense. So now I want you to think about how hot the road was when we hit it. So Joe and I hit the road and I just give him this look and I say, we've been on dirt. We've been on dirt in forests, this hard, hot pavement that we thought we were going to move on. Cause I told him, I was like, dude, once like, we get to the pavement, I was, gonna, I was yeah. like, let's just take like two and a half hours to do this half, this last half marathon. Cause originally it was like, dude, we'll hammer it. And I was like, yeah, like I'll just like dig deep and we'll just like push as best we can. Last half marathon. We were kind of joking about getting a half marathon PR, yeah. but my feet hit the pavement and I looked at him. I was like, I don't think I can go yeah. a half marathon. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like I, I, it just took, like my breath away. It was hard and it was hot and there was no shoulder. Like it was this very empty, like country road, but there was no, you know, sometimes roads have shoulders that are dirt and I was just craving dirt. Mm. I was like, I just need to find dirt. I need to do something. But what we ended up doing, it took us so, I, I want to say it took like four and a half hours, maybe almost five hours to do that, that half marathon. Mm. I had to stop so many times and I would, I would sit down on the side of the road and I'd lift my feet up to let them cool, take a couple deep breaths. And then I would stand up and we would start going again. And Joe like knew how much pain I was in, but he was like, Sally, the only way that we're going to finish this is you moving. Like Mm -hmm. you're going to like, it's, it's just going to be painful. Yeah. And I kept saying like, I'm going to sit in pain I'm going to walk in pain. I'm going to run in pain. So choose, but uh, we need to get to the finish line. We started to, thankfully he's so lighthearted and this really did help. But like there was a couple of times I, I found like a little dusty dirt pile and I would just go and stand in it. It was like soft. It was cool. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it's amazing. It was like, and we just started laughing because I was like, it is so weird. That's like weird. the things that I'm doing to try to get to the finish line right yeah. now. Like I am trying to do anything to give myself a relief just for a few seconds from how bad my feet hurt on this road. Mm. And Joe, you know, because he had put in so many miles, he started to get some like significant arch pain in mm. one of his feet. And I remember finding a stick in the ground and him taking off his shoe and just grinding his arch into this stick. And then he just carried the stick with him. (laughs) So we were like laughing. I was like, what are we doing? Like, I'm trying to find dirt piles. You're rubbing the arch your foot out in a stick. Like people behind you, like driving. Who are these invalids? Like, right. right? (laughs) It was so ridiculous. And yeah, we, a couple guys passed us on the way, which made me so mad because we were just moving so, so slow. Fine. Finally, we're getting closer to the school. So this race ends on a, on a track, on a high school track. I remember Hillary's live feed when she, she had some of you coming off of that road. And I remember looking at you. Oh, you at looked at you. me what I look like. Well, that, but I remember like you coming at the camera and I was like, man, that is, it looks painful. Like the way your like legs were kind of Yeah, describe and, it how you described it to me when I got home. Oh, I can't remember what I said. I just remember your legs were like, turning in or one of your legs was like really turned in. Yeah. And I don't know. It just looked, my whole torso was sideways. Painful. Yeah. Yeah. So I've noticed, cause I did this at Cocodona too. When I got the more significant sore and ulcer on my right heel, my whole torso, I started leaning to the left and I was subconsciously trying to take weight off Mm -hmm. my right side. And so I felt like if I lean to the left, then more of the weight will be on my left side and I can give my right 
side a little bit of a break. Alleviate a little bit of that pain. And I realized I was doing that at the end of this race. I knew that Hillary was going to be there. And I remember running along like the last mile and seeing all these wild flowers. And Hillary Yang, Billy's wife, is like my sister. She is so precious. We're such good friends. And so I picked some wild flowers for her. And it was so cool when she found me with the cameras were entering into the parking lot of the high school to finish this race. I go, I got you wildflowers. She's like, I got you a butterfly. And she had a butterfly and I had flowers. And I just like, we had like this moment where we were like, oh, she knew that I had been suffering for so long. And we just have like this love for each other. And so I'm giving her the flowers. She's giving me the butterfly. And I was like, look at us. <laughs> you guys are both going on like, no sleep. So you're we're just both all going emotional. on no sleep. We were like 100%, like so emotional and like, So then she follows me to the track and I remember thinking, wow, this track feels like four times bigger than a normal track. I felt like I was like (laughs) running on it forever, but I was like, I'm going to run this as best I can, like try. I think I started crying because it hurt so bad, but I was like, I want to finish this race Mm -hmm. as strong as I can. Saw that finish line, got closer and closer, 10 feet away, five feet away and did a little hop and then very quickly took my shoes off and sat down and and was so grateful that I didn't give up. Yeah. So grateful that three down, one to go. Mm-hmm. We did it. Yeah. Each I think each of those three finishes now have been very, emotional. Very well, yeah, emotionally, but very unique in their own way, right? Like they've they've kind of each told a story of you know the way you've come in on on those ones, and this is just another another one in the book. So it was. Mm-hmm. I was. I mean, just watching it, you know. From afar, it was it was? I was glad that you finished that, mm-hmm. crossed that finish line, and you were done with that one. To give people a perspective, it took me the same amount of time to finish Bigfoot as it did Cocodona. Yeah, that's which, that's how much I struggled. Cocodona is a fifty extra miles. Yeah, fifty extra miles. Right? Yeah, like forty. This yeah. was like two ten. Cocodona is two fifty. But it it gave me that perspective too. Like yeah. that's. That's how difficult it was. And I think looking back, you know, this idea that I I'd really made the decision, I'm not doing this race. I need to heal. Like I need to take care of my body. Like this is just ridiculous. Then somewhere along within those 17 days, I, I had that reconsideration. Maybe I can get to the finish line. And if that is my one goal is to get to the finish line, I believe that I can do it. You know, and there was a lot of, variables that I had to face in a very truthful way. You know, I had to accept that this is not ideal. As a coach, I wouldn't recommend this. Mm -hmm. You know, I would never tell someone to do 250 mile races or even road marathons within 17 days of each other. Like it's, I'm not superhuman, Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think sometimes when we are going after a goal or we want to accomplish something in life in a very real way, When I think of people who are starting their own business, I love hearing the stories of the first two years when people start a business. There are some really extreme situations that people put themselves into. You know, it's like I was in the red in my bank account for two years straight. I had no money. I was, I was literally eating ramen. I had no mattress. No sleep. It's kind of like an ultra marathon. No, seriously. And just the, the sacrifices you make because you believe in your whole heart that that goal is worth it. That one day that business is going to be worth it. One day that business is going to be successful. And I think that, um, applying these type of things to real life is, is very powerful that, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what it looks like to to achieve something, you are saying to yourself, I will be uncomfortable. I will be in a place of frustration. And you know what? I might fail several times along the way, but because I believe in the goal, I believe in the purpose, I believe in what I'm doing. And I I want that. And, and it's okay if other people don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. It's okay if other people aren't along for the ride. One of my favorite stories, and I've told this ever since all the way back when I was a freshman English teacher, I'd like to tell little stories like this to my students to inspire them because pain and failure are some of the biggest de- deterrents in us going after a goal mm-hmm. or going after a dream. On top of that, very closely are our critics, you mm-hmm. know, what other people say. But Walt Disney, who created Disneyland, he went bankrupt five times 
before creating that amusement park. Now, since he was a child, he had this dream of creating this amusement park that was just fun and magical and, you know, the happiest place on earth is what it, it's coined. And he, he was so obsessed with this dream that this is going to happen. I believe in this. But can you imagine what it was like after going bankrupt for the third time yeah. and then going back to his family, his friends, his investors and saying, but wait, next time is going to be better. Mm. I mean, the, the stories that surround him and the people at that time that were like, you're crazy. Yeah, you're this is ridiculous. Like you need to know when to quit and hello, it's been three times. Well, then he went on to be bankrupt two more times after that. Mm -hmm. But look at Disneyland today. Look at the impact it has made worldwide for, you know, over 50 years, like um, of 70 years. I don't even know what their anniversary is, but it's so inspiring. Yeah. And there's so many stories like that in history where people chose to stand in the middle of the storm and say, yeah, I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to have people disagree with me. I'm willing to have very few friends understand and stand alongside me as I push towards this goal. I know there are going to be some things that I regret. I know there are going to be some moments of discomfort and some things that, you know, maybe some mistakes I make along the way. I'm not going to get it right. And I think that's what I feel is like, I know I'm not perfect and executing everything perfectly in these 200s, but I am trying and I am trying to learn and discover about this distance, but also get the best out of myself and learn who I am as an athlete, I feel like my greatest growth and the, the most that I've grown is mentally, mm. mentally listening to the stories that I tell myself as I'm doing these 200s, how I work through the challenges and the pain and the setbacks along the way and how I'm ultimately able to apply those to my life. And, you know, in, in sharing these stories, it's, it's really neat to hear, you know, like I said, I've, I've met hundreds of people just in the last few weeks who have said, you know, that this, your podcast and your book have helped me in my everyday life. Mm. And that for me is like, I feel like it is all worth it. Mm. Because if you've listened to the Choose Strong podcast for any stretch of time, you know that Eddie and I say over and over again, even though we talk about races and running, we are genuinely talking about life. How can you apply these things to your life? Because that's where the most important things are, you know, races are recreational activities. They're opportunities that we get to sign up for. And especially with these 200s, I'm like, it's expensive. It's time consuming to do these races, but in our everyday life, how are we interacting with people? How are we interacting with pursuing our goals? How are we interacting when we fail, when we have setbacks, when we encounter critics, you know, apply these things to your life and, and see what happens. Choose strong in all that you do. And, you know, my, my hope is we, uh, enter this nice, I have a couple of weeks of recovery before I start training again. You know, my hope is that you, our listener, um, will be able to listen to these podcasts, maybe go back and, and listen to the Tahoe one too. I think Tahoe and Bigfoot 200 and, and listen and, and find out what things resonate with you. You know, so often I like to encourage people that after you finish this podcast, write down a few notes for yourself. Like where can you relate very specifically within these stories? Where is the encouragement that maybe you needed to hear that you heard today? Because the reality is the nothing that I'm doing is because I'm superhuman. There's nothing like extraordinary about who I am. All I did was commit to a goal. I trained for it. And this is what's capable for all humans to do. But what are the things that you're training for in life or that you're pursuing in life or that you're currently um, going through right now that you need a bit of encouragement and, and you need to kind of pause and think about what are the steps that I'm taking to make myself better? What are the steps that I'm taking day in and day out um, to eliminate distraction, to eliminate um, the negativity from my mind? And really, am I looking to the left and the right and kind of being obsessed with everyone else is doing? Or am I being still impatient and focusing on that one goal that I'm working towards? So we really hope that you understand that we keep you in mind every single time we do these episodes. We care a lot about you and, and being in our community. And if you feel like you don't have anyone in your corner, Eddie and I are in your corner. Yes, we are. Eddie, would you like to add anything else to the podcast today? Is there anything about the race or? No, I'm just 
stoked that you got three done now. Mm. One more left. Mm. Yeah. Yep. One more left. One more. So what do we got coming up? Got Moab 240, Mm -hmm. October 14th. Moab 240. I think it's like 59 days. And here's one little note I have to say. This year, they decided to add 13 miles and 3,500 feet to this year's Moab race. And Mm -hmm. I just giggle because it's like Tahoe. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to add 14 more miles and however X more running, it's going to be at the hottest um, and totally hardest like course. I'm like, all right. Like every single race has like this new, new route, new challenges are added to it. So, um, another adventure, another adventure. But before we head out to Moab 240, we have quite a list of things coming up. We do. We trips have a and couple trips. Mackenzie's doing some recruit recruiting trips. She's got a couple colleges, trips. and so yeah, that'll be fun. But yeah, I think just getting you your feet healed up and mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, getting you some weight put on and getting <laughs> some strength back, and that way you'll be ready for October fourteenth. And I'll be heading to UTMB, so I'm leaving on Thursday morning. That's right. UTMB week. I will be going to France, so I am not racing, even though I am on a um, entrant list to race. I have decided not to race, but I will be there that week. I have a few photo shoots, some activations, some appearances. So if you are there, I would love to meet you. I'd love to give you a big old bear hug. And I love just that week. I mean, being in the Alps is definitely where my heart is, but that week in Chamonix with thousands and thousands of people from all over the world uh, is, is truly special. From there, I'm flying straight to Colorado where Mackenzie is going to be having her first recruiting trip and the whole family is going out for that, mm-hmm. which will be really special. And then I will be heading to Texas. I think I'm going to do a podcast with my good friend, Nick Bear. And then if you are going to the Mammoth Trail Fest with my buddy, Tim Tollefson in Mammoth, California, um, it's a three-day event. It is incredible. I'm not racing it, but they are having the Golden Trail World Series finale there. And I will be there. I think I, do, I am doing some type of appearance or talk or something. I think I have to iron that out. But if you don't know about the Mammoth Trail Fest, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's, in my opinion, one of the greatest parties of the year. And this is only the second year that they're doing it. But the first year was a wild success. I almost consider it to be kind of like a mini UTMB Mm. weekend, but I would love to meet you if you're at that. And and that is like September 23rd or something like that. And then a couple weeks later, we will head to Moab and um, we will be doing a film on Moab 240. That is going to be the finale in the series. And when I cross that finish line, it is the start of my off season. So um, I'm really looking forward to the next six weeks. They are going to be very busy, but also in ways that I I really love because I'll be around the community. Um, I'll be back training, be healing up. And uh, yeah. Yep. Three down, one to go, baby. Yep. Let's go. Yeah. Listeners, thank you so much again for being here with us. We love you. We care about you. We hope that you keep choosing strong in all that you do. And if you have a moment, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please write a review on Apple or on Spotify. You know, we did give away 10 hats in, let's see, like last week it was, Eddie chose 10 winners, the Choose Strong Hats. We will be doing that again. And we'll let you know um, when that next giveaway happens. But every download, every Every review is super helpful to us and very much um, appreciated. I know, especially for Eddie, Eddie works so hard on this podcast and he reads every single review that comes through and it just really encourages him. Yeah. I love it for you, Eddie, that you get to see those reviews. Thank you for that. And we will, we will be joining you guys next time. Yes, we will. Yeah. I think, I think we're actually recording another podcast tomorrow. We're doing like back to back. Yep. Yeah. The Mental Game Part 2 will be our next podcast. But until then, keep choosing strong. Mm -hmm.